Hey everyone, it's Daniel Newman. Welcome to a special 6-5 conversation. It's a big news day. And if you've been following my stream for a while, you know that uh, I've been tracking very closely all things AI accelerators, GPUs, what's going on in the overall AI space. We're sizing the market. We're looking at new architectures and everything from you know, next generation architecture designs to value being created from AI at the customer level. You'll also know, though, that you've seen me post probably a few times about Grok, a company that I have been advising for several years and that I am also an investor in, putting that out straight up front. And <laughs> let's just be, be candid. So, you know, as an analyst, um, an advisor and consultant, it's very rare that I join a cap table or an investment round. Um, it, it's got to be something that just absolutely is mind-blowing and awesome. And from the time I met uh, with you and the team over at Big Rock, I saw so much potential in what you were doing. And of course, it's been stops, it's been starts, it's been iterations, it's been changes. But you, well, you and your team at Grok had a great <laughs> today. So all that work you've been doing, what's going on? What, what news do you have to share with our community today? Well, we're, we're happy to announce that we have now completed a Series D uh, fundraising round for Grok, which means the future looks really, really bright for us. We've, uh, we've managed to raise over $600 million, and um, it's exciting times, right? Because we see where the market is going. We see all the growth and all the demand. You hear about even the incumbents talking about it. And as a startup, you're wondering, hey, you know, are we going to be around? And thanks to this opportunity, uh, the future looks very bright. So, so to be clear, you raised six hundred million in a D. And if, if I'm not mistaken, in your C, it was what three hundred million at a post money one point one billion roughly. That's right. That's right. So we've actually raised six hundred forty million dollars in this round, and then um, our valuation has more than doubled uh, considerably. And so, all good signs to how the market is looking at AI and sort of where they see the application shifting and where people are going to start using this infrastructure and in their services and in their solutions. So, you know, the big part for us is that um, people that have learned about us have actually understood that we had something pretty radical as far as the performance from our V1 LPU, which is our our processor. It's a language processing unit. But, you know, we've always had plans in the roadmap of developing new versions of those systems and then even the next generation silicon, which we had already announced as a partnership with Samsung. And uh, that was going to get us from our 14 nanometer chip to a four nanometer chip. So, you know, the amazing part is we had only scratched the surface and we're already blowing people's minds with this accelerator. And the next generation of the chip is going to do so much more. So, again, I think it's just a great time to be at Grok. Yeah. So it sounds like there's maybe still some dust settling on the exact post money. And uh, that, that'll be out to, to be heard. You know, nobody ever kind of leaves that blank. But I mean, you know, a doubling during a time where, it, you know, the macro has been complicated, interest rates are rising, the market hasn't necessarily seen a ton of, of value in anything not um, NVIDIA GPU. And right. you've sort of defied that. You've, you, you've defied that by doubling your valuation during this period of time. We've seen some of the other sort of startup uh, AI processing companies stall out a bit, struggling to raise money, struggling mm -hmm. to show customer wins. Y'all made a pretty big pivot though, Mark, over the last mm -hmm. six months plus that seems to have been somewhat the catalyst of, you know, not to say you weren't doing well, like I said, I always saw the vision, but you were sort of mm -hmm. plodding along. And then it, it seemed like all of a sudden you made a big acquisition, you made a big change of, of strategy. Talk a little bit about what that was. Yeah, I mean, I think Jonathan Ross, our CEO, you know, he always had this this vision to bring AI to the world. He he would tell me even in the earliest days, I want anyone with a credit card to be able to have access to this level of compute. And that was that was his approach to the theme you hear many companies talking about for democratizing AI. But, you know, when OpenAI actually started having Chat GPT become present and available to so many, so many people in the world. The world very rapidly got educated on what the potential was from LLMs and Gen AI. And so that very luckily for us was around this time that we also had our technology matured and was available and we were bu building a cloud solution. And then um, you saw suddenly a shift where the open source models became very interesting and competitively capable of a lot of this function for services. And you know we all know that open source technologies generally eat private for breakfast. 
And uh, you've, you've heard those announcements from Zuckerberg and others about the models from Meta. You've seen things from Mistral with their, their Mistral models. And we supported all of those and made those available for free to the developer community. And that was the big change was going back not quite six months ago, we decided to take our cloud solution, making it uh, accessible through an API. And it actually uses the same endpoints as OpenAI. So anybody that already had an existing application built with ChatGPT, uh, they could do three simple steps, really some, literally swapping a word three times in their code, and it would actually run on Grok using any of the models that we were providing. So we went from having you know, 10 to 20,000 people using our chat LLM interface to suddenly providing a cloud solution, which was developed as a, actually as a part of the acquisition of a company called Definitive.io, Definitive Intelligence with um, uh, Sunny there as, the, as their leader, Sunny Madrip. And uh, they really are experts in this field and that amplified a lot for us. They knew what the developers wanted. They know how they work. They knew what that trend had been, how people had adopted OpenAI. And so they just brought us into another level of service while sticking with Jonathan's vision to say, hey, let's make it free. And so once that happened, people started messaging. We had this virality moment where they just said, we can't believe it's this fast. We can't believe it runs the way that it runs. And a lot of people were skeptical. So what we've really been doing over the last several months is every time a new model comes out, we add it, we make it available. And it continues to prove that the performance and the quality is there when it's powered by Grok. So again, I, I can't say enough thank yous to the people in the developer community who have just been willing to try something different and break away from the incumbents. Yeah, it, it, it definitely was a noticeable shift. Yeah. And after that definitive deal, Sonny brought a ton of credibility. There were some pretty nice highlight moments on the all in pod. Yeah. Um, you know, we know Shamath is a on the cap table uh, and has been involved. Earliest investor, yep. Yeah, he's got very, um, you know, he's got a very influential platform. But, mm -hmm. you know, I've been just sort of watching. I've been watching how you've grown virality in the brand, how you've uh, really gone out and focused on this open source community, starting to kind of watch the way the developers talk. I just mm -hmm. just this recently, that past few days, you know, I was sharing a, a developer who had built an open source um, search, you know, a generative AI search using all open source tools, running inference on Grok, and just absolutely elated. He was elated by the yeah. speed that the inference. And you know, I went on and played with it uh, a bit too. And you know, just seeing how someone can build an all open source, completely uh, open and available tool like that, um, and make it really compelling and really fast is yeah. is great. Now, I do want to ask a question. You know. It's big news, $640 million, double your valuation, customers are growing, developers are growing. This is something, though, that I'm going to ask, because remember televisions, Mark, you're, you're a brand and a creative guy. Remember television resolutions got to the point every year it was 480, 480p, yeah. 720, 720, 1080. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And it got to a point where I don't know about you, because it was like, <laughs> okay, I get it, it's cool. Um, you could kind of make the same argument about iPhones, 13, 14. I'm on a 13 Pro Max. And the reason I haven't upgraded <laughs> yet, I don't know the difference. Like, why is this speed? Why is being able to generate so many tokens and doing it so, why is this so great? Because there's a point, like, I can't read the text faster than it's being created. So, yeah. like, I know this is cool, but, you know, for everyone out there that's kind of asking that question, how does Brock stand for this? Besides just making it fast, you know, you don't want to just become a, a you know, the next hyper car. There's not a big market right. for that. You need to be a car that can fill the roads, get people to, you know, so what's the thought process Grok has on being more than just fast and why is fast so important? Well, I think you, I think you have to understand as well, where are the problems that are starting to arise as the enterprise adopts this technology? I mean, it's great when the consumer level user is sort of using these LLM chat-like experiences as a replacement for Google. Hey, I want to ask a question. I get an answer. And that's a pretty fundamental way you see a lot of people using chat in an LLM, right? And that's, and that's great. But when you start talking about, we want to deploy enterprise scale applications, the reason these models keep getting bigger is because they're trying to improve the quality of the models. Now we've heard people talk about things like, you know, using a RAG database, which gets a little technical so that you can have specific um, information and data relevant to the application. You hear people talk about fine tuning. You hear people talking about all kinds of things. But what happens is every time you insert some layer 
to the infrastructure and the stack of your application. And now the hot topic is everyone talking about mixture of agents. You'll hear Andrew Ng talking about this. You'll hear a number of experts talking about it, where you're not just talking with an LLM, but you're talking with multiples of an LLM that have different sysprompts, meaning they have different personality types, right? You have different personas in the way that it reviews the prompt input, which means each one of those ingest tokens generates tokens. And then you typically have some sort of master LLM agent that creates the output as you're using all these other agents to consider the variables. So you could say one is a really creative agent to write an answer. And you could say another one is a very grammatically specific and very rigid type of agent. And then whatever they both produce, the master agent takes the best of the both. All of those tokens being generated are going to slow down your application. Right. Right. So what you're really doing is you're introducing improvements in quality with bottlenecking at scale. So if we're already to the point that you made faster than any human being can read, that means we've created a massive margin of opportunity to improve the quality of applications for the enterprise while still delivering at a speed that humans find useful. Now, that's if you're doing those sort of human interfacing applications. But then you get into the world of like financial trading where they're dealing with streaming data, right? And that's no longer about the speed that you're reading words at. That's actually the applications taking in that data and being able to answer questions faster than anyone else. And that's the difference between you getting the jump on the deal or not. Yeah. Well, I think you made a great point, though, there that there's the part of the token generation for language of what we're consuming. Mm -hmm. And then there's the part of the ability to actually access all that data and and generate because like when you get more and more complicated data sets and of course we know that there's a bit of the holy grail mark is the it, it is the the tie up it is the conjoined uh relationship that's going to exist between data sets right like the graph the entire database of all of the company's data assets estates structured mm -hmm. unstructured um prem cloud across multiple clouds yep. uh you know and and to be able to train models that can then read all that quickly, whether it's whatever technique, right? Whether it's RAG technique, whether it's some yep. sort of fine tuning yep. technique, that is able to access all that and then give a good answer in real or fa at, a, at the fastest pace possible, it does create, you know, so really in the end, it sounds to me like, you know, if I'm going to stick with the car analogy, because I like that, you know, it's like, <laughs> like the, it's like the M series BMW, you know, you want to create something that's fast but high production. You want to, be able right. to create it fast and high production. You're a motorcycle guy. So, you I know, know, like, you know, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those uh, sport bikes, they can they can run pretty darn fast. Um, well, I think I think there's a you know, for us, you're seeing a lot of people in the model building community experiment. So, for example, we've seen Google build these models that have massive sequence context links, and the reason for that, and we've even seen in recent papers that when you have a, a large context length, meaning what can it retain as an input and output at one one instance. Um, you know, there's some studies now showing that that improves quality greatly versus say, let me have, you know, a rag over to the side. So the good thing for us is we don't build the models. So as we see the models continue to advance, we just need to make sure we have that engine for the M series yeah. that people can really get that performance out of. And for customers that are in the enterprise, they no longer need to fear sort of this, this idea that I'm stuck with this one model and now that's my software stack for the next 12 to 18 months, rather say, hey, Grok, we hear that this new model is coming out and it's going to be superior in these ways. Will you be able to deploy it? And of course we will because we've done that since day one. So for us, imagine being able to swap out that M class whenever the new version comes out. And that's that's really a brilliant opportunity. Just going to call it Jonathan Shelby from here on out. <laughs> Shelby. We, we, so, so I got like a minute, you know, yeah. left here with you, Mark, and really appreciate you taking some time with me. I'm I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, see this next wave of opportunity mm -hmm. and growth for Grok. I've been a big proponent of competition in this particular space. I'm, you know, I think innovation drives innovation. Iron sharpens iron. I totally yep. think having more strong competitive companies, and I think the overall growth of the AI market is palpable, despite mm -hmm. some of the concerns about when when measurable value reaches industries. And I think mm -hmm. democratizing open source, low cost available access is going to make that more possible, right? When you're paying 3000 for a, a chip instead of 30,000 for a chip, That's right. I mean, look, there, there is some economics here. I know Jonathan always talked about bringing the cost of compute down to zero. And I right. also know 
Jensen likes to say, the more you buy, the more you save. So they're, they're both saying things kind of similarly the same way. But listen, the last thing I want to talk to you about is there was this pivot, right? Y'all mm-hmm. went from kind of like we might be training inference and chip. And then you went to we're just inference and chip. Correct. And then you kind of went we're cloud inference and we're going to sort of make this more of an accessible sandbox for development. But then it seems to me that there is some some really substantial growing demand for your silicon too. Like yes. it isn't just going to be, by the way, access to silicon through software. It's going to be, there's some people that are saying, look, we want to use your LPU. We're going to stand up our own stuff. We're going to use your software. We're going to build our own software on it. Just talk a little bit about how that's evolving. Cause I think that that's important for your economic story is that you're going to be able to move volume of chips for people that want to buy accelerators. And then of course, you're also going to continue to d- democratize and make, um, affordable access to the sandbox. Yeah, yeah. So we call this our uh, our ramp uh, to access. So you know, for somebody that wants to build software and not have a major overhead, like a lot of the startups and and you know VC funded projects out there, they can jump on the cloud solution, grab an API key for free, and start building. But then you talk about the hardware side of it, and obviously there's going to be instances where people want the hardware on premise for security reasons and other proprietary reasons. So that's when you look at the sort of deals that we've been doing with Aramco Digital in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You look at what we've done with Earth, Wind, and Power out of Norway, where they're talking about building these inference compute centers. And obviously you need to have some uh, range of how you provide that solution. So we've got the cloud at the base end, you've got the ability to have something dedicated for a customer in a data center that we can manage or they can manage. And then you've got all the way up to selling them racks that they can put on-prem for themselves. So we're working all of those kind of deals right now with a, a large variety of customers. And you know, a big reason that became the potential it has is because the developer community has built applications literally in hours that have proven thousands of times now that this technology can make a difference. So that's really captured the world's attention. And the question has come back around, so what can we do with your with your hardware? And uh, that is really what I believe inspired a big part of this round. And that's the first commitment we've made with this Series D investment is the millions of LPUs that we're going to be deploying. So those orders have been placed. We're talking to the foundries and uh, we're gonna be very, very busy and growing really, really fast over the next 12 months. Yeah, well, look, you, you have a lot to be proud of. You and I have uh, been speaking for years. I've got probably, what, no less than four or five sit-downs with Jonathan. Yeah. I know you've been a, a big part of uh, turning Jonathan from uh, the magician in, in the lab to <laughs> quite a prolific speaker. And I think as the company continues to grow from billion to billions in valuation and hundreds of thousands of developers and, and some really big new customers that... Uh, you know, I know you, you've you brought new team members on. Uh, you brought Stu Pan, who most yes. recently has been running the foundry business for Intel. I'm uh, going to come over here uh, with Brock. Uh, so that's very exciting as well. But Mark, look, congratulations. Thanks so much for making some time. I know you're off to talk at a bunch of events. The company's been on and featured everywhere. Um, you know, hit that subscribe. Check out all our content here on 6.5 and, and, and within the Future Group. We've covered Croc for years. Check out all my content across social. I'm breaking down the AI space, the chip market every single day uh, here. Uh, CNBC, Bloomberg, you know, you name it. But uh, kudos, congratulations. Pass my best on to Jonathan, Adam, and the team. And Mark, we'll be seeing you soon. So thanks so much. Talk. Talk on, go on, rock on, grok on. (laughs) Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys again.